So Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Dave. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone uh, in Utah. Presenting to you from Southern California. Uh, my name is Jim Lestage. I work for Reliance Worldwide Corporation, which is a parent company for Holdright, Sharkbite, Cash Jack Me, John Guest, and Streamlabs. I've been with Holdright since 2006. Prior to Holdright, I worked in the construction industry as a plumber for 10 years in Southern California, getting my journeyman card and then working on several large scale projects uh, in the Southern California market. <clears throat> Joined 2006 with Holdright and got my bachelor's degree from Southern or South California State University, San Marcos in 2012. So here, Introducing a little bit about Holdright, I'm sure most of you folks listening have heard of Holdright or seen products from Holdright or even used products from Holdright. Holdright was acquired by Reliance Worldwide Corporation in 2017, and we've continued to offer products and services. Uh, most of these you can see in most of the plumbing wholesale shops that you go to or buy your plumbing supply products from. But as you can see going down this list here, we have all kinds of supports and products uh, for the plumbing trades and electrical trades, uh, fire stop systems, uh, pipe restraints, inserts, clamps, overhead supports, uh, you name it. Reliance Worldwide Corporation is also the parent company for Sharkbite and Cash Acme, uh, two brands you probably are also familiar with. So our uh, product categories uh, through Reliance Worldwide Corporation are represented in Utah and Southern Idaho by Franklin James, who is our fact representative in those markets. So moving into our presentation for today, we're going to talk about pipe supports and restraints on plumbing projects. Uh, this presentation is or organized originally for the mechanical engineer community because the need to know more about what folks in the field are doing and how to specify products relevant to the trades. So learning objectives today, mostly again for the engineers, be able to identify the difference between a field device method and an engineered solution, recognize the value and importance of disallowing field device methods, we'll get into more details of what that encompasses, be able to effectively update plumbing specifications. So when we're talking to engineers, and architects, we're showing them best practices based on our experience and product mix of what can help them achieve the design of their project and execute the project construction effectively, safely, and efficiently. So today's content, we're looking at plumbing specification versus intent versus implementation, how to eliminate field device methods, and we're going to look at some ideal piping support and restraint options. A summary, there's no assessment, uh, so don't need to worry about that. So the plumbing specifications, if you're a foreman or a superintendent and you have been handed a set of plans and specifications for a project that you're about to begin construction on, you know you've got to spend some time reviewing those documents and understand, one, what's your scope of work as a craftsman on that project, and what does the specification tell you that they want you to use on that project? And then the plans are going to kind of show you how to go about and executing that project. The plans, specs, and details are everything to a plumbing superintendent and foreman, and that's how you lay out your work, and that's how you execute the project. The plumbing specifications a lot of times are misinterpreted as this is how we do the project. Well, it's not entirely true. The specification is going to outline specific applications uh, specific to the project in terms of product and methods and means to a, to a degree. The rest of that is going to come from your education and experience gained as a craftsman in the field. So you'll see catch-all language in the specification sometimes down at the bottom bullet. It says all work shall be done in a workmanship-like manner and in compliance with all building codes. So that's assuming that you know what you're doing as a craftsman and you understand the local codes and the jurisdiction in which you're working. If you're relying on that language to explain to you how to do your job, if you're new to the trade or you don't understand exactly what you're supposed to do, it can lead you astray and leave you to your own devices in terms of, well, how do I do this here or how do I install that there? And sometimes it can result in not desirable results. 
So some examples, I'm sure uh, if you've been in the trade long enough, you've seen examples of what a work or a uh, field device method looks like. You can see examples on the top left there that uh, you know they're using scrap metal on the project to provide support platform for a pipe outlet. Uh, this middle picture the same, and then on a wood frame project, this is still uh, a preferred method for a lot of craftsmen that uh, feel it's more expedient to use what's available on the job site to provide pipe supports and restraints versus using something that was actually designed for it. Couple interpretations of workmanship like manner. Which one reflects the intent of the specification and which one would you prefer to leave behind on the project you're working on? So on this picture that just popped up, we see that we have an application where the walls aren't installed yet, but the plumber needs to support his pipe safely and effectively so that when the wall framing does go up, the pipe is where it needs to be. So on this application, they've used uh, several pieces of channel strut cobbled together using the pipes coming out of the wall as a means of support. Uh, some code jurisdictions don't allow that. They, you can support pipe on the vertical, but you can't support pipe on the horizontal using other pipes. So that would be an issue for an inspector coming through. Now, if this is a temporary means until the walls go up and you're going to use something more permanent, uh, again, that could be acceptable if this isn't the leave behind once the project is done. Or you can use something that's designed for that application, comes right out of the box. You can leave it in place. Most inspection jurisdictions don't have a problem with this <clears throat> because, again, we're supporting the pipe on the vertical as an alignment. So the pipe pictured on the right isn't bearing the weight of the two copper tubes. It's simply using a bracket to keep them in alignment where they need to be until the wall framing goes up. Field device methods are time consuming. So when you think about the time it takes to locate the chunk of wood or whatever you're going to use to nail in the stud bay and support your plumbing, you're going to have to measure it, cut it, you got to shape it to fit sometimes, you got to toenail in the bracket or the piece of wood so that uh, it stays in place, and then you mount your pipe. So a typical installation like this, uh, you probably can see it taking longer, but eight to 10 minutes is a fair time for something like this, assuming all the materials are readily available. The field device method delivers inconsistent methods and results. So as you can see from these three pictures, the one on the left is using a chunk of wood to support pipe coming out of the wall. The one in the middle is a, another example of pipe on pipe support where they've cobbled channel strut together to provide that uh, means of support. And then the picture on the far right, you can see that uh, they've used a piece of uh, uh, some kind of metal strapping to support the pipe off the floor because it's set back from the wall quite a ways. But then you can see the pipe has been bent out of place, which means if you try to bend it back in position, it's probably gonna crack the pipe and you're gonna have to go back and repair that. So these are might be easy remedies in the field when you first think about it, but in the long run, they don't last through the pace of construction. Sometimes field device methods can come under scrutiny by the local jurisdiction and the inspector, if he doesn't like it, he will write you up a, a violation notice or a defect notice, which you have to go back and then correct to their satisfaction before the job can proceed. Sometimes this can cause a delay on the project, especially if your piping in wall is rejected for improper support or position, and you've got to then go back and correct that, which means the drywaller can't do their work and the other trades can't proceed until you get your correction notice satisfied. Another drawback for some field device methods is that they can pose a life safety hazard. Now the photo on the left is a picture that was taken in the field for a suspended water heater platform solution. You can see that they've used uh, what looks like channel strut constructed to provide a platform on which they put what looks like a 40 or 50 gallon gas fired water heater up in the air with no restraint or other means of securing it to keep it from falling or tipping over. Now the one on the right is an example of an engineered solution. It's designed specifically for the purpose of supporting a water heater or other equipment of that size and type. And it's got engineering drawings and calculations so that the installer knows it's rated for the purpose that they're going to use it for. So eliminating field device methods, we advise the MEP engineers to update their specification to disallow 
field devised methods. In other words, they're going to incorporate language that will encourage the installer to use materials manufactured for the specific purpose of supporting systems, equipment, pipes, and accessories. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no field devised methods ever allowed on a construction site. I had a, a situation here in Southern California where we were putting together a steam system in an equipment room. Well, the equipment room didn't have any load bearing walls, so it was nothing to mount the pressure reducing system for the steam system on the wall. They were all non-load bearing walls. So we had to actually fabricate and manufacture a stand in the field to support that system. Well, the way we went about doing it was we calculated the weight of that pressure reducing uh, station for the steam and figured out a way of creating a system of support using L iron and we drew it up, calculated it, submitted it to a mechanical engineer for inspection and approval. They put their stamp on it. So that then became an engineered solution that was designed and developed in the field. And you'll run into that from time to time on certain projects because you'll run into situations where there isn't an off the shelf solution for the challenge you're facing in the field. We also advise the MEP firms to provide guidance for various installations rather than saying you can't have dissimilar metal contact in a project, especially between copper and ferrous metals. So we're gonna guide them with language that helps steer the plumbing installer to select the correct uh, choices. So in this in example here, we have hangers for uncovered uninsulated copper or brass piping, including medical gases shall be factory applied, plastic coated steel brand similar to, you know, whatever manufacturer or model number the engineer feels is appropriate for the project or copper plated hangers. So guiding them with specification language makes your job easier because then rather than just leaving you to figure out how to avoid that dissimilar metal contact in the field, they're guiding you to solutions that you can use that are cost effective and efficient. Inviting qualified manufacturers to offer specification guidance is another way that MEP engineers look upon us as a resource to help them write their specifications in a way that prevents or avoids unnecessary delays on the project and also allows them to design their projects more efficiently so that everything is covered and nothing left to be addressed in an RFI at a later date. Not that RFIs are ever going to go away. I think that's going to be something we will see in this uh, industry for years to come. The engineered solution, on the other hand, delivers consistent and reliable results. So you can see in all these examples of products being used specific for the purpose rather than using materials readily available in the field, the contractor has chosen to use products which allow their teams to install more efficiently and quickly and move on to the next project. The engineered solutions are also designed to meet the intent of plumbing codes and specifications. You know, the code language is fairly uh, vague in terms of what they want you to do, but all they want really is that you use products and methods and means that comply with the intent of the code, which is what the inspectors are looking for. The engineered solution eliminates the field devised method. So in that first example we had with the block of wood supporting the CPVC pipe coming out of the wall, we figured out it takes them eight to 10 minutes to do that versus a minute to do something like this. So they take this solution right out of the box, mount it to the wall, insert their pipe, lock it down and they're done. The inspector comes along behind and they see a professionally done installation so they're not going to be looking too closely for things that might raise red flags such as this installation here on the right. The engineered solution eliminates the need to measure cut material for pipe supports. So now that we've gravitated more to battery operated tools, we're not really running out cords that much, but still every time you pick up a power tool, you encounter the risk of injury uh, from using that tool. So the less you can, or the more you can avoid that, the better off and safer you'll be in the field. Engineered solutions are approved and accepted by most local and uh, national code jurisdictions and approval agencies. So we're gonna look at the, some categories here of overhead primary supports in wall secondary, and then we'll talk about cast iron no hub pipe and fitting restraints. So the ANSI MSS or Manufacturing Standards, uh, which is designed to 
guide manufacturers in the material design, manufacture, selection, application, and fabrication and installation. Now, the MSS standards usually address pipe hangers and supports designed with load ratings of 150 pounds or greater. Now, there's also another standard out there, which is the IAPMO PS42, which talks about secondary pipe supports and in-wall uh, plumbing alignment systems. And these are some examples where the MSS standard will come in here and here, as well as here. There's some other primary overhead pipe supports using uh, proper support and strut restraints uh, to keep the pipe in position and keep it uh, functioning throughout the life of the project. In-wall secondary supports are governed by the International Code Council and the Uniform Plumbing Code. And language here you can see is piping shall be supported in such a manner as to maintain its alignment and prevent sagging. And that's from the California Plumbing Code, section 314.2. And then hangers, anchors, and support shall support the piping and contents of the piping. Material shall be of approved material. And that's from the International Plumbing Code, uh, 2012, section 308.3. IAPMO PS42 uh, is intended for the secondary pipe support in wall systems. And this is area where the field devised or makeshift method are often observed. So an example here, we have a plumbing installer that's trying to align their pipe and keep it supported in the wall, but they also are trying to accomplish a couple other things. One is dissimilar metal contact because this metal bar is made of steel and the copper tube can't come in contact or should not come in contact with it, especially if there's going to be moisture present. Another situation they're trying to uh, satisfy is probably acoustic noise abatement. So they wrap it with felt and they use tie wire to keep everything in place. Or they could have chosen a method that was designed specifically for that application and installed it in a more efficient and professional manner and not have issues to deal with later on, such as this tie wire resting off or what have you uh, later on in the life of the project. Another examples of uh, in-wall secondary supports, this is from a hospital project. You can see how a lot of these systems are designed for fixtures that are specific to a healthcare application. In this middle picture here, we have uh, set up for what's called a, uh, uh, it's a, it's like a mop sink, but it's a uh, bedpan washer uh, type setup, a clinical sink. Sorry, I lost my words there for a minute. So this clinical sink application here, you've got the uh, outlet drain, which is the same size as a, a water closet uh, drain. Up here you have your uh, mop bucket faucet or a bedpan washer. And the same thing up here, you've got your piping system set up for the vacuum breaker as well as the flush valve assembly. So all of these pipes have to be coming out of the wall in specific locations so that when they mount the uh, clinic sink and then the associated uh, trim and hardware, everything lines up and matches perfectly with that installation. Imagine trying to do that with uh, pieces of metal or scrap metal studs and keeping everything in alignment. The time it would take would be more than it took to use, than it took to use a product such as this that was designed for it. Another example here of in-wall secondary supports to keep pipe from rattling in the walls or moving about. Uh, this is another thing that uh, inspectors look for is to make sure that the pipe is rigid within the walls and doesn't have a lot of space to move about and make noise. So moving into the last category that we're going to talk about today, which is the no-hub pipe and fitting restraints. Uh, this is an, There's an increased focus on the topic of restraining cast iron sole pipe, uh, more specifically with the no-hub uh, piping systems. Uh, prior to the no-hub pipe system coming out, this issue really wasn't uh, prevalent or really addressed because using a lead nocum system, your joints were a lot tighter and a lot more rigid. Unfortunately, with the use of uh, products like lead in the field, it's become uh, a less attractive solution, even though there are some markets in this country that still do lead nocum piping. But with no hub pipe and fittings, the potential for pipes to come apart under thrust force is much greater. And we've got some examples to show you here. One was the uh, Lucas Oil Stadium uh, project that was being built in July of 2008. Uh, they had a rainstorm during construction. They had just installed the rainwater leaders for the roof area. 
Uh, there were four 15-inch rainwater leaders, three of which failed during the rainstorm, causing millions of dollars in damage. Now, the millions of dollars in damage come from the fact that prior to the rainstorm, they would just moved in all of the electronic equipment and telephone equipment for the stadium a couple days prior to this storm hitting. Uh, so when these rainwater leaders came apart during that storm, all of that electronic equipment and gear that was in the lower levels of the stadium became flooded. So that's uh, part of where a lot of the problems came from. The other reason that this became a publicly known incident was that the project was being funded with public money and it was being covered by the news agencies in the area, you know, which were monitoring for construction overruns and costs overruns. And they were making it very apparent that uh, there were problems with the project from the beginning of construction. Now, when the rainwater leader systems failed, there were the Companies doing the work, one uh, went bankrupt prior to the uh, accident, and then another plumbing system took over. So between the two companies, we don't know which company actually installed the rainwater leaders that failed. But uh, safe to say that when they went back and looked at why they failed, they discovered that they weren't properly mounted or restrained against thrust force coming off the roof. Now, to get an idea of how much rainwater these 15-inch rainwater leaders were handling, the total area of the roof of the Lucas Oil Stadium is about six acres. So you can imagine that much rainwater collecting on a fairly large area like that and then going into four downspouts. There's a significant amount of water force coming down those pipes and then changing direction from vertical to horizontal, which is where the failure occurred. So from that incident in uh, Indiana, with the Lucas Oil Stadium, the International Plumbing Code amended the code section in section 308.7.1 to mirror the language in the Cast Iron Soul Pipe Institute's installation recommendation manual. And we'll take a look at what that language says in a couple slides. Uh, from 2009, uh, MEP engineers started enforcing compliance with the Cast Iron Soul Pipe Insula Institute's installation recommendation asking for details on their drawings, recommending installers restrain their pipe and fittings in a way that prevents axial movement or separation under thrust force. And a mechanical engineering firm uh, called Smith Seckman Reed or SSR, as some folks might know them, requires a contractor to restrain hubless pipe drainage fittings on the Orlando, Ma Orlando Magic Stadium in 2009. Well, that project is now known as the Amway Stadium and it's where the birth of the engineered solution for no hub pipe and fitting restraints came from. Another system failure here was the Translational Medical Research Facility in Pennsylvania. We had a project that was recently completed in 2012, and shortly after the project was turned over to the owner, they experienced a trail winch rainwater leader that failed, which also caused millions of dollars in damage, and hence, more engineers are being drawn into this as damages are being uh, mitigated or damages are being identified and they're looking for ways to overcome exposure to that uh, risk of being called into a lawsuit in the event of damages. So International Plumbing Code 2015, this is the language that was included after 2009 when they updated it and this is the language that closely mirrors what the, the uh, Cast Iron Soul Pipe Institute has in their installation recommendation. So for pipe sizes greater than four inches, restraints shall be provided for drain pipes at all changes of direction and at all changes of diameter greater than two pipe sizes. Braces, blocks, rotting, or other suitable methods as specified by the coupling manufacturer shall be utilized. So this is fairly broad language and kind of leaves the reader believing that whatever they do, as long as it satisfies the braces, blocks, rotting, or other suitable methods, that they're okay. And for a long time, that was accepted practice because there was no standard or method used other than some of what we'll see in pictures coming forward. The Uniform Plumbing Code simply says that the plumbing system shall be installed in a manner that is in accordance with this code, applicable standards, and the manufacturer's installation instructions. And this last part here, manufacturer's installation instructions, gets overlooked quite frequently. A lot of times when we're taught in plumbing school or trade school how to do things, it's based on 
industry standard and best practices that were handed down from generation to generation. And the old adage of, well, we've always done it that way becomes the norm. So when something new comes along like no hub pipe and fittings uh, versus the bell and spigot type piping systems that were put together with lead and oakum, the old way of doing things kind of becomes obsolete because now we have a system that requires a little more attention to installation detail. Cast Iron Soil Pipe Institute's recommendation for installing hubless pipe and fittings is that horizontal pipe and fittings five inches and larger must be suitably braced to prevent horizontal movement. This shall be done in every branch opening or change of direction by use of braces, blocks, rotting, or other suitable method to prevent movement or joint separation. So we can see in that book that they've got a little diagram of what they are talking about, but then when you look for these types of materials in a pipe hanger catalog or, or any other type of catalog, you don't see anything like it. The only thing that comes close are maybe what can be construed as riser clamps or pipe clamps. But this metal bar, there's nothing currently manufactured that closely resembles that. So fast forward to 2015, and after all the attention has been drawn to the fact that the hubless pipe and fitting requires additional restraints on pipe sizes five inch and larger, we have a pipe manufacturer that is taking this a step further and including these big warning labels in their installation catalog to warn the installer that they must restrain pipe and fittings five inch and larger uh, using brace block, rotting, or other suitable method to prevent movement or joint separation. They also go on to say that the heavy duty or wide body couplings are not a substitute for proper thrust restraint. This last sentence here gets a lot of people's attention because it says that failure to properly restrain branch openings or changes in direction will result in joint movement or separation, causing system failure and potential serious injury. Now, when the first time I read that, I thought that was a bit of a stretch. You know, how could pipe system that comes apart in a coupling cause serious or potential serious injury? Because most times in my experience as a plumber, when we didn't restrain our system during test, you got wet. Nobody ever really got hurt. Then we've got language from the uh, Tyler Pipe, which is now the McWayne Group. No hub pipe and fitting restraints are required because no hub pipe fittings and couplings are rated to withstand 10 foot ahead of water for testing purposes. Now remember, Gravity drainage systems are exactly that. They're not intended to hold water or carry water pressure for any length of time other than to transfer waste from one point to another. So if you've got waste systems that are constantly being subjected to thrust forces equivalent to 10 foot ahead of water in the life of the system, it appears we would have a problem with design. Either it's the upstream waste is overwhelming the system, it's undersized, or there could be other factors such as blockages uh, or forced discharge going into the system. This table comes right out of the Cast Iron Soul Pipe Institute's uh, installation recommendations. And this thrust chart here is a guide to the installers, let them know that, okay, if I've got a 10 foot head of water on my pipe system, the equivalent pressure at the base of the stack is 4.3 PSI, and the associated thrust force based on pipe size is also listed here. So inch and a half pipe, we see that with a 10 foot column of water, there's gonna be 12 pounds of thrust on the base of that stack. If you look all the way up here at five inch, which is where you start to de uh, need to use restraints or construct restraints, we see that the thrust force is quite a bit more significant. There's almost 100 pounds of thrust on the bottom of that fitting. If you're putting in the 12 or 15 inch cast iron sole pipe, I remember the Lucas Oil Stadium, if that was more than a 10 foot head of water, there was almost 900 pounds of thrust on the base of that stack when that rain, uh, when that rain system hit. So this red line is drawn at the 50 foot head mark because that's where the engineered solution is designed to perform at its maximum capacity. So if you have a pipe system that's going to see or has the potential to see thrust force of up to 50 PSI, you want to consider a thrust restraint system that will withstand that. So on the uh, medical facility we talked about, the uh, translational medical research facility in the beginning of this slide with the 12 inch rainwater system failure, uh, on the fifth floor here, we see the offset here in uh, yellow and red 
This yellow pipe is all 12 inch rainwater leader going into a rainwater system. And this uh, 12 inch double offset here separated during the rainstorm, fell through the ceiling of the fifth floor stairwell and crashed to the floor. Now, after reading that warning label from Charlotte Pipe, we can see where that potential for serious injury does exist in systems that are not installed correctly. So on this system here, the engineer went back and did a forensic analysis as to why that system failed, because the installing contractor made the claim that the system was undersized and therefore the rainwater that entered it overwhelmed it. But when they went back and did their forensic analysis, they calculated that during that rainstorm, it was only 82 pounds of thrust at the time that this system came apart. Now, remember that chart we looked at earlier. If they had done a 10-foot static head test on this section of pipe, it would have seen a lot more than 82 pounds of thrust. In fact, we can see that with 12-inch, 10-foot head of thrust would have been 538 pounds, which is the code standard for testing pipe. So it tells the engineer that obviously the installer did not test as required for that system. So it went back to the installer. The other thing they noted was that this section of pipe here with the double offset was not supported by any hangers from the ceiling. It was simply relying on the no hub couplings to keep that pipe section in place. So a couple problems had, they had to go back and correct it. Uh, and so from these types of failures in the field, we see more attention being drawn to the need for pipe thrust restraints on no hub pipe systems. When properly restrained using the engineered solution, fitting three and four would not have separated. Now, if they weren't properly pressure tested, uh, there may have been leakage with that amount of thrust, but this system would have remained intact. It would not come apart and follow through the ceiling and hitting the floor. Now, this is something that you know we see quite often. I saw it quite a bit in the field as a plumber. And when we are required to restrain our pipe and fittings against separation from thrust force, and we don't know of a product or approved means or method that's out there, we kind of gravitate to what we know. So riser clamp has become the kind of a catch-all tool for all kinds of uh, applications in the field, everything from keeping the pipe supported at every floor to being used in this application here to contrive some kind of thrust restraint to keep this section from coming apart under thrust force. Now the problem with most riser clamps is that they are kind of a one size fits all device. If you don't size it correctly to the type of pipe you're putting in, if you're using a uh, schedule 40 steel pipe clamp uh, on a cast iron sole pipe system, it may not fit exactly right. It may be a little loose or vice versa. So in this, picture here, we can see a pipe thrust restraint that's contrived in the field. On one end, they've got channel strut, and on the other end, they've got a riser clamp. And the hardware's run through the riser clamp and then clamp down. How effective is that? Well, we don't know because nobody's ever tested it, uh, but we can rest assured that this riser clamp will probably at some point slip or move down the pipe, or this hardware could come dislodged and come out of the pipe if enough, enough thrust force is applied to this system. Now in this application here where they've got channel strut on both ends and rod going through the channel strut top and bottom, you know, if they're using a heavy enough channel strut and they've got this rod tensioned enough, that this system could be effective in keeping this from separating under thrust force. But again, you have to look at the application and the materials you're using and ask yourself the question, is this the appropriate use of this device? And if it's not, then we need to look at something a little more durable or something that we know will work in the life of the project. Here's another example of the riser clamp and threaded rod being used as a restraint device. The problem here is that this threaded rod is bent along the uh, outside radius of the pipe in not in alignment with the thrust forces that are being encountered on this pipe. So if they had rotated this clamp 90 degrees so that this rod was on the inside of the radius here, it would have a better chance of keeping this pipe and uh, fitting from separating. As it sits right now, it's not going to do much good because the pipe can still uh, misalign and move off of this axis here enough to cause a problem. 
It's another example here where they're using a combination of riser clamps and uh, angle clamps or angle brackets to uh, create some kind of a system here. Again, without product specification or testing, will this system work? We don't know. We hope that it will, but we don't know. Last but not least, we have an example here, uh, again from Indiana. We don't know the name of the project, but uh, they're using service weight pipe for above ground storm drainage uh, for the system. Now, in my experience, I've never used bell and spigot pipe for anything except below grade application, again, because the issue of thrust restraint, thrust force uh, compensation. So on this particular photo, when uh, our representative was on the project, the contractors were in the process of subjecting this system to a 10-foot head of water test. Well, they knew that with 10-foot head water, this system was going to come apart, so they shackled everything together using come-along winches and crane straps to keep everything in place until the test was done. Once the test was done, all of this stuff went away. So if it wasn't going to survive the test, how can we expect it to survive any kind of measurable thrust above 10 feet uh, during a rainstorm? which is obviously what they were anticipating. So maybe we'll see some pictures down the road where this system came apart. We don't know. And again, most attempts that are field contrived are varied and consistent. We don't have any test data on any of these solution applications here, except that this is something that they've done in the past. They haven't had a problem with it. The engineers or the uh, inspectors didn't know enough to question it and it was accepted so it kind of got the rubber stamp of approval of that's how we've always done it without ever really subjecting it to test to see if it really would work in the in the actual application that it, that they're anticipating will be encountered so in 2010 an engineered solution was brought to market uh, it was designed and tested to restrain 50 foot head of water Comes with specific installation instructions. It's fast, safe, easy to install, and accommodates no hub pipe and fittings two inch through 15 inch. And here's some uh, diagrams of that product. So some of you may be familiar with it. It's model specification language, which uh, we recommend to design team engineers. And this is a proprietary example. In other words, we're going to list a manufacturer and model number as the uh, basis of design for the engineer to represent to the installation team uh, for use. Now, some engineers, unless there's more than one manufacturer to list, they normally won't list a single manufacturer. So we have a non-proprietary uh, specification language, which talks about, again, following the installation recommendations in the SISB handbook, chapter four, which covers that segment uh, in its entirety. Brace, Cobbless cast iron pipe and fittings five inch and larger using a system designed and manufactured for the specific purpose of restraining hubless cast iron pipe and fittings. So language like that can help guide the installer to selecting the best application solution for that uh, requirement. Here's some examples of the engineered solution for the 10, 12, and 15 inch pipe. You can see here that the uh, materials used were selected based on their design and intended use, uh, these are not riser clamps, these are called pipe clamps. And the difference is, is that these are designed to have a specific torque spec uh, assigned to them so that we know we're getting enough grip strength on the surface of the pipe. If it were a standard riser clamp, chances are if you were to apply the correct torque spec for this system, these flanges would come flattened out and bottom out before that there is enough grip strength on the surface of the pipe. And again, the materials here are selected, again, to counter that thrust force of 50-foot head of water or less. For the smaller diameter pipe, 2-inch through 8-inch, again, uses materials selected for that purpose that were tested and shown to function well up to 50-foot ahead for a variety of pipe and fittings and fitting arrangements. So to sum it all up, uh, we advise the... Plumbing contractors who do their own design work is to review the plumbing specifications that you're abiding by and introduce language that disallows field devised or makeshift methods. Uh, we can certainly help with that. Uh, add appropriate standard code or guideline so that those who read the inspections understand that 
the makeshift method is not allowed and that there are appropriate means and methods available to select from. And last but not least, replace your field device methods with engineered solutions. So that is it. If there are any questions, uh, you can certainly forward them to me uh, via email. Let me go back to the, uh, or my, my email address is jim.lestage, L-E-S-T-A-G-E, at rwc.com. I'll be more than happy to take your questions, uh, or you can call me at 760-310-5432. So Dave.